Hello, cinefans. I'm Kendall Kruver, and this is Watching Classic Movies. I was honored to spend time with my guest, director, writer, producer, and playwright, George Stevens Jr., founder of the American Film Institute, creator of the AFI Life Achievement Award and the Kennedy Center Honors, and winner of honors including the Emmy, Oscar, Peabody Award, and Writers Guild Award. He began his career helping his father, Hollywood director George Stevens, make films, and later moved to Washington, D.C. to make films for Edward R. Murrow, where, in addition to his eventual work with AFI, he worked with nearly every president from Kennedy to the present day, and knew some of the most celebrated artistic talents and political minds of his times. Mr. Stevens' new memoir, My Place in the Sun, Life in the Golden Age of Hollywood and Washington, is a fascinating document of the different worlds, societal shifts, and amazing people he experienced. I found myself tearing up multiple times reading this moving tale of triumph and loss, which celebrates a remarkably rich life. It's an awesome story, shared by a kind and humble man. We had a great talk about some of his key moments. Welcome, Mr. Stevens. Thank you for joining me today. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So the, the thing about this epic book of yours is it starts with your ancestor administering a pistol whipping mugger who made a very bad decision. And it actually gets more interesting. <laughs> I guess the question I had, because a lot of those parts in the early portion of the book seem like well told family lore, things that how much research did you do and how much was just kind of stories that you'd heard as a child, that sort of a thing? Well, my, my mother um, kept everything. And she, when she passed at 104 and three quarters, um, it, 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 these boxes, I knew they were there in her house uh, with the papers from the grandparents, clippings, uh, diaries, all this information, photographs, which was wonderfully helpful. And uh, you know, she had the wedding license of my grandmother and grandfather when they got married in San Mateo, California, having driven from San Francisco. So I had just had a lot, had a lot to work with. It was more paper than than tales. So how many discoveries were in there for you? Things you just never heard of? A, a good deal. Um, because we didn't talk a great deal about family. You know, I knew my parents, my grand, three of my grandparents were actors. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't, you know, a lot of detailed discussion. Uh, so I remembered some things because obviously there, <clears throat> there was talk and they had had these other. And then I the Internet, I found uh, things, you know, from San Francisco in 1903 and four uh, that I'd never seen before with detail about my parents and my grandparents. Well, I thought it was remarkable. I mean, both of your parents seemed remarkably engaged with you. Like they both they'd had time for you. And especially with your father working six days a week, I can't believe how present he was in your life. It doesn't seem like your typical Hollywood story. Right. And, and he was present, including even though for three years he was away. Uh, at war. Um, he kept all the letters I wrote to him as a, as a young, you know, aged 11 to 14. And um, the letters my mother wrote to him, and she kept the ones he wrote. And they're all in the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in the Stevens collection. So to be able to look, look back and read the exchanges I was having with my father um, was, you know, wonderful. I hear you just recorded the audio version of your book. I am in the process. I'm going back to work when, uh, at one o'clock when we uh, finish this, yes. What's it been like going back through your story in that way? It's been, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's very time consuming and uh, demanding, uh, but I'm glad that I'm doing it. I, I hear from so many people who read audible books uh, that they much favor them when the author is narrating rather than a, a third person narrator. So I'm happy to be doing it. And I'm able to personalize it a little bit uh, in the reading, uh, make it more spoken than the exact text, which is sometimes helpful. 
I have to say, I agree with that. Like I will read or listen to a book again, mm. even after having read it, just to get that extra bit of personality. It does make a difference. Well, now I'm going to have to work hard to, to, to see if, if you will cry at certain <laughs> passages. I'm going to, you're putting the pressure on. Really did move me. There was so and, and in parts of your life, there were things that really moved me. And I think a lot of it was that there's just so much empathy and, and kindness in your community, you know, from your father, from other people you worked with. And I felt like some of the things that your father did and that you took on were remarkably progressive for the time. Like he was in his work practice an anti-racist. Yes. And he was not the shouting director. Uh, there was a passage where you're talking about him on the set of A Place in the Sun and he's gentle with Montgomery Cliff yeah. and Elizabeth Taylor. He he leads them to their performance. Yeah. How did that affect kind of the crafting of your own worldview? You know, it's interesting uh, to tell a story years, that's not in the book, but years later, when I was making a mini series called The Murder of Mary Fagan, and a friend of mine was directing it and I was producing it and writing it. Um, and we were on location in Georgia at night in a train station. And we were kind of rushing and he asked me if I would direct a part of it where the actors are getting on, on and off of a train. And his name was Billy Hale. And he'd worked with my father and knew my father. And he came over to me and he was almost, he was so moved. He said, I thought it was your father's voice. I heard you directing the actors, you know, so, uh, Obviously, I, I took on board this manner of his, which was, um, you know, making the actor comfortable um, and, you know, creating, creating a space, you know, for them to do their best work. Um, so, and, and I also say in the book that my father never, I don't recall him ever t telling me to pay my taxes or, or do, do the right thing. Everything from him was by example or inference, you know, there were no bromides or kind of, you know, you sit down and I'll, I'm going to tell you how this world works. And I've, and I, and I think he, he also taught me to be a father in that way. Um, yeah. If, if my tone on a, on the set directing is similar, similar to his, I expect my tone with my children is similar. Yeah. Absolutely. I love the way that he nurtured you, but knew when to let you go. That that moment you described yeah. where you're walking together and he and you're talking about this job offer you've gotten in DC. You've been invaluable to him on the sets of his films, but he just stops and says, "Oh, yeah. it's time for you to move yeah. on." And that that yeah. so that took you from having many of your father's qualities, but yeah, I, I think again the phrase the phrasing yes to find me. But, he said, you know, I, I think you may have to do it. I think you may have to do it, you, you know, which was really giving me a passport, you know, because I had turned it down to, to telling Edward R. Murrow, who had offered me the job, that uh, I really was obligated with my father on the greatest story ever told, having just finished the diary of Anne Frank with him. Um, and so it was, yeah, but just, you know, he, he had good judgment. What a gentle way of putting it, too. I think you may have to do yeah. it. Like, he's not pushing yeah. you, but he's also like, oh, honey. You <laughs> yeah. So, DC. Yes. And, and, and you're using skills that you've learned, and yet you're also in the political world. And more than once in the book, you say, my two worlds collided, or, or the political and the entertainment worlds melted together. Mm -hmm. What did your Hollywood experience do for you as you navigated a different world in, in DC? How different was it? Well, it was uh, very different and, and in some respects the same. Uh, and, you know, working in Hollywood, I, you know, I had been directing Alfred Hitchcock Presents and Peter Gunn and episodic. So I'd been doing directing on the set and I'd been producing alongside my father and I'd been watching him for many years. And when I get to Washington, I, my job is for Edward R. Murrow at the United States Information Agency. 
to produce around 300 documentaries a year and you know find the filmmakers you know work on the films and persuade people in this large agency uh that these films are right you know you had the advisors from from asia from the asian area from africa from europe and they all had a little different feeling about, about how the film should play and i had to win my way and make it come out my way and you know all of that that i'd been doing in hollywood uh and having you know had to stand up and deal with people with substantial authority uh it just made it a comfortable fit for me i i i felt i felt kind of at ease doing it and i you know yeah you know, I, I was younger than most of the in fact all of the others you were trained well trained yes yeah that's um interesting how mm. how you were how that particular training was good for that setting how well it melded together so i afi what a remarkable thing in our culture you know just how much it is done i i i think it's so interesting i'm actually going to dip back again to when when your dad won the oscar for i think it was when he won the giant oscar and he was saying something about let's see if it stands the test of time yeah no it, it well I'll just tell, tell the story i went to the it, it was not the giant oscar it was earlier and i went to the academy awards with him um and sat next to him and joseph mankiewicz the fine director who had won the oscar the year before i think for uh, all about eve came out to present the award and he read the nominations um john houston for an african queen william wyler for detective story vincent minnelli for an american in paris elia kazan for a streetcar named desire and george stevens for a place in the sun which gives you a sense of the caliber of work in those days <clears throat> and my father won and but driving home the oscar was on the seat between us he was driving the car and he he looked over and he said and this is before dvds or streaming or retrospectives films came and went and he looked over at me i was about 19 and 18 and said you know he said we'll have a better idea of what kind of a film this is in about 25 years and he was talking about the test of time that he knew that you know pictures come out and they're fashionable in in the year of their release but you, then they're forgotten and he he cared about making films like fine art like that he appreciated in the theater that would last and the so i went to a screening recently in new york at the film forum of a place in the sun it's 70 years old and to sit with an audience spellbound by a 70 year old film is a wonderful experience and it really speaks to everything that guided me and i care about uh is that quality of excellence and lasting value what how was he imagining this film would be seen though, when he's talking about the test of time like was he thinking of a screening like that at the film forum but just that in theaters but just the general idea i mean he he could not have imagined all of the means you know and then that you and i would be sitting here looking at one another across the continent uh with these tiny instruments yeah but but he knew that that having that film before an audience um that humans would respond if the film has a timeless quality well i i felt like that was a a big moment in the book like a kind of formative moment and another one was the um the french archivist um let me try and say this name uh, henri langla uh, you say it perfectly excellent at con how he came up to you yes you know distressed about the state of film preservation in the united states mm -hmm. it was would there have been an afi if he hadn't had that conversation with you or do you feel like it it would have happened without it it felt like that was a moment it may have happened in another way than the american film institute because the museum of modern art and george eastman house were preserving films but more on a local level than as a national 
And when we started the AFI, which was five years after my meeting with <clears throat> Maori Langwa, um, we, I made an arrangement with the Library of Congress uh, to stimulate their activity in preserving films. And we became the, the people that went out and found the films. You know, there, there are now 40,000 films in the AFI collection in the Library of Congress preserved. Um, and, and, and we brought them to them and they did the, um, the work on the technical work in, in re-photographing and repairing them. I mean, this is an awesome accomplishment. It's just to think of this facility in uh, Col Culpeper, mm -hmm. Virginia. Yes. Underground, 40,000 yeah. yes. films in storage. Yeah. It's, it, I really can't wrap my mind around it. We're watching uh, many, many, many of them on Turner Classic Movies. Yes. And you're seeing in retrospectives when they do a retrospective of John Ford or King Vidor or Dorothy Arisner, you know, the, um, these pictures, nobody evaluated them when we were, we were finding them, storing them, and we we're going to let history judge whether they were the ones that were going to be important because that was sort of the rule of the archives, save everything and, and, and you will learn what remains important to audiences. I guess that's what I mean is there's so many opportunities for discovery. Yeah. You know, like 20 years ago, Arsner was, on, was not really on anybody's lips, but now she's fairly well known to among at least the sorts of people who watch TCM. Yeah or who yeah. might like to go to see repertoire film, you know, that kind of a thing. Right. And, and nobody, nobody then was saying, oh, we must save Dor Dorothy Arzner's film. You know, they, they, they knew Chaplin and Keaton were important and, and others, uh, but by saving everything that was in the vault, in a studio vault that we might acquire and give to the Library of Congress, uh, there would be things in it that weren't known yet to be important and valuable. So does that mean that you were trying to save without making a judgment on what you save? Was, was it just a process of saving as much as you possibly could? It really was, yes, yeah. Were there things that you searched out as an organization that, that you felt needed to be found to be preserved? When we started this process, we asked the leading archivists from the Eastman House, the Museum of Modern Art, the Library of Congress, and the AFI. And they made a rescue list of kind of 120 films. So it was not mindless what we were doing, but it was inclusive beyond what were the, the on the rescue list. What, um, what rescues stand out to you? I mean, is there anything you're particularly proud of? Oh, gosh, so many. Um, interesting was John Ford, the great director's first film, <clears throat> was called Straight Shooting, and that it was lost. And it was found and rescued in Czechoslovakia. So John Ford's Straight Shooting, which had subtitles, survives with Czech subtitles. <laughs> so there were, yeah. I love that. Is, is the whole idea of something being found in an attic true then as, as far as films? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I was hoping I would have the time to ask you this. I, I, I dove in wanting to hear stories about you, you and the AFI and your father and Elizabeth Taylor, which you deliver in this book mm -hmm. many times, but I did not expect to be so intrigued by all of your political life. I cannot, have you you have mm. worked in some capacity with every president since JFK. Am I correct in thinking that? Yes. Actually, I, I didn't really do anything with Gerald okay. Ford, but all of the others. Yes. Now, I always had in my mind that JFK, that was someone I heard about my whole childhood. You know, my parents talking about mm. what I missed until very recently was just how remarkable Robert F. Kennedy was. Oh, yes. I had an inkling of it the, the night of Martin Luther King's death, the 
the speech he gave in the back of a pickup truck, how, how he talked about his own loss, how he quoted poetry, yes. knowing that would move this crowd. I had an inkling of how he had kind of a, a touch that could extend to anyone mm -hmm. because of that moment. But in your book, I really understood how he matched this remarkable intelligence with the ability to understand and move many people. I mean, what was it like knowing this man? Oh, well, it was, uh, you, you know, he, he, he was wonderful to be with. He was fun uh, and, of course, interesting. And, and, uh, and but he was, uh, really had a quality that the country needed at that time. Um, he could speak to so many aspects, you know, the, the, the working people, African-Americans, young people. Um, and uh, I really believe he could have pulled the country together. Uh, Mark Shields, who passed away this weekend, uh, was on the news hour for 30 years, being the democratic side of, of you know, the uplifting discussions between two points of view. And I've just been read in his obituary, he, he said that there's no question in his mind, Robert Kennedy was the person who would have been the best president of his lifetime. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, to be with him, and of course, you think life is going to go on forever. And, uh, you know, so the, the shock of Bobby being killed uh, could not exceed that of John F. Kennedy, which was so shocking. But I think the consequences of Bobby's death are even greater than those of, of uh, President Kennedy, because we were at a stage where Bobby was our, our best hope. I think I understood that in reading the passage of you being on the train. Mm, yes. But this funeral procession going back to DC and, and people of all you know, walks of life mm. being there at the train. What, what was that experience like? And, and, beside, and beside the tracks, you know, as we rode on the train, you know, on both sides of the train, you just saw people America, you passed, you know, from north to south, seeing America, you know, some people saluting, some people holding flags, nuns, uh, the poor. Uh, uh, it, um, was a, it was a profound day and experience. I mean, just that experience alone is so remarkable, but your, your story is full of remarkable experiences that touch on so many interesting aspects of history. Looking at, at this amazing tapestry, what stands out to you? Like, what are you really proud of, excited about? What do you treasure? Oh, I'm, 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 I try to avoid the word pride, but i pleased with either the things I've been able to do and some of the things I've been able to accomplish. Um, interestingly, I made a number of films and won a lot of Emmys and an Oscar and stuff like that. But the film that pleases me the most is the one I made in 1984 about my father, George Stevens, A Filmmaker's Journey, which is shown from time to time on Turner. I think it's on HBO Max and other places, um, Criterion Collection. But again, I took the opportunity to make a film about him because uh, I wanted to tell his story and I narrate it and, and it was very personal, but it was, you know, wonderfully received. And I think the, uh, the satisfaction of doing that was may, may have been equal, but never exceeded. It keeps you, it kind of takes you full circle. Mm -hmm. Right. And starting the Kennedy Center Honors that we were able in the 37 years that I wrote and produced it, um, to be honored uh, 188 artists, you know, and to have, had those people become part of my life, maybe for a weekend or maybe forever, as in so many cases, and that people of accomplishment and, and, and values who'd overcome adversity to become what they were, it was just such a rich uh, experience. And in writing this book, I now realize that it was this range of friends that Elizabeth, my wife and I had from the entertainment world you know, from the Kennedy Center Honors, from politics and journalism, it was the richness of 
those associations that kind of informed this book. I want to go back before I let you go, mm. but I want to take you back to the beginning. Um, yeah. Seeing James Dean at the Egyptian when, when it's all new, I, it made me think about, I mean, I, I just went to Hollywood for the TCM Film Festival and it's so different even from when I started going there, you know, as, as a teen. What was it, the feeling in Hollywood in those early days? Well, of course, it, it was the beginning for me, the era that I was living in, but it was far from the beginning of Hollywood. And you know, it was uh, just a, it was a stimulating environment. Uh, if you kind of have a creative bent and, you know, want to make films or direct television. Uh, and I was associated with so many interesting people. You know, I've, I just assumed that was my life until uh, Edward R. Murrow came into the picture and proposed a different path. And so I would have been content to, uh, you know, I'm sure to continue doing that, but I would have never known had I not made that decision to, to, to make a change, I would not have known of all these possibilities that uh, were provided to me by taking that path. Yeah. Well, it's an inspiring story and I'm, I'm you know, all prepared to, to, to bawl my eyes out listening to your audiobook. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Just such a moving, detailed um, story. And I, I, I really, I really, you know, hope people get turned on to it and discover all its wonders. Well, it's just been such a pleasure, um, you know, talking with people who have read it and, uh, and uh, to, to sense their appreciation, you know, that as, as John Guare, my playwright friend said, you know, you, you, I like to sometimes skim books, but he said, I, I couldn't skim it because somebody, somebody knew was going to come in in the next page and I didn't want to miss out. So I'm happy that people are uh, are you know enjoying it, and I hope they find some shared values in it. I, I think they will. There's a universal kind of empathy and kindness to it. It infuses the whole thing and, and makes it kind of a special book beyond your typical memoir. Uh, uh, well, thank you. I appreciate your time today. It was wonderful to talk to you, and I wish you the best of luck finishing up your audio book and all your other pursuits. No, well, thank you. I really love talking to you. For more information about George Stephens Jr.'s book, go to watchingclassicmovies.com. Thank you, listeners, for your continued support. I deeply appreciate every social media share and kind comment. Please rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you subscribe. Thank you for listening. This is Kendall Kruver, watching classic movies. Until next time.